So uh, Providence Living operates a 150 bed facility um, currently called The Views in, in Comox. And the, 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 the facility sits on the site of an old general hospital that's been decommissioned, St. Joseph's General Hospital, which was the general hospital um, for the, uh, the, the, the community of Comox and the Comox Valley uh, for close to 100 years. Um, the uh, hospital's now been replaced by two really lovely looking um, uh, North Island hospitals operated by Island Health. And so Providence uh, now retains a 13 acre site um, once the, the hospital has been demolished, we'll have all of the land. And we're replacing um, the old 140 bed uh, long-term care facility with a new 156 bed facility on the same site. Um, now, that wouldn't be too unusual. Lots of, uh, lots of uh, new, new long-term care buildings happening across the country. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide, Christine. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build this facility um, on the basis of um, the, the, the dementia care approach taken by the De Hoogway Group, Holland. As you can see, we're, the, the, the facility is um, kind of a circular type building, two levels. Um, and we, we're modeling it after that dementia style village that, that has been pioneered by people like De Hoogway in Holland. The, uh, the, the households are 12 bed um, households, self-contained. Mm -hmm. Each household has its own dining room, um, its own laundry facilities, its own lounge. And the goal is that each of those uh, 12 residents living in that small um, that household will become um, a family, as it were, with staff that work in those areas. The goal is to take away the institutional task-driven style of care and create a more home-like environment. Now, there's not much unique in that. Many people across the country are delivering long-term care in a home-like environment. Um, I think it's something we've talked about in this, in this uh, area of care for a long time, but lots of people are doing it very well. Um, what's different for us um, in Vancouver, on, on Vancouver Island, is that we haven't managed to, to deliver it um, in small uh, single bed environments like this to any great scale. So we don't have many of these facilities in the publicly funded um, arena in BC. We certainly have them in the, in the privately funded uh, arena and so with this building what we're trying to do is to create that that home-like feel in a small scale environment um, maybe we can go to the next slide christine um, again i think the video you're going to see shortly explains this probably a little better than than me um, going on but what you can see here um, is is the circular environment the and this is what's so relevant to your presentation today today you're going to hear from two experts um, in the area of using um, nature as a therapeutic modality. And that's indeed what we're trying to do here. You'll see the central courtyard. Uh, the rendering you see here isn't the final design. It really is uh, just kind of a rendering for, um, for, for working purposes right now. But what we'll be doing is designing that interior courtway to in, uh, incorporate many of the things you're gonna hear about today, hopefully. Uh, we believe that nature is, a, is an important part of um, keeping people with dementia in touch with their, their physical surroundings. And for all the reasons you're gonna to hear today, calming, supportive, um, and therapeutic for, for anybody, but particularly for somebody with dementia. Um, two, two things to point out, uh, we are a Catholic health organization. So on the left of the picture you see currently, you'll see a, um, uh, it's a chapel. Um, and, and then the little red uh, building with the red roof, that's actually an indigenous longhouse. It's a mini indigenous longhouse which we have been developing in, in conjunction with our partners at, with the Comox First Nation in Comox. So first of its kind, I think it'll be an actual First Nations spiritual space, um, meeting place um, for the First Nation community, not just associated with the facility, but from the surrounding community to use. So we're trying to bring the community into, um, into the care environment. And then ultimately we will build out the rest of this site. So this, this building is about four acres of the 13 acres we'll be adding that village piece so that the rest of the village becomes a dementia friendly um, community for everybody. Um, can maybe go to the next slide, Christine. Um, again, just a couple of renditions of, of kind of what we expect it to look like. Um, the, the, the bottom two pictures actually come from the Dehukwe group. 
So we're, we're trying to build on using light, the natural environment, um, as much as we can in all of these cottages. Um, now, I think what I'll do is I'll, I, I won't use the rest of the slides I have in this presentation. I think I'm just going to go to the video, which is about 10 minutes, I think. Um, and then we may have a time for a couple of questions before we introduce our speakers. When I get older, I would like to be treated with respect and dignity. Just be treated like how I'm treated now, really. I don't think the aging process doesn't change who you are. I think it would be very hard if a person hadn't had a full life. You know, they'd be trying to play catch up. It does take courage to live into your elderly years, you've lost some of the physical abilities you have, you may have lost some of the mental sharpness, um, and people judge. I think families are trying their best to keep their loved ones at home, but if you have kids and a life and a full-time job and your mom has dementia and she's leaving the oven on, it gets kind of tricky. Long-term care needs a redefinition. We are now waking up to the fact that our elders have been neglected for a very long time. Sooner or later, it's gonna be us who may need to live in these sorts of situations. The last 30 years have just disappeared. I'm 84 now. I've lived here five years. The first year I was in a different wing. It was a four bed unit and that was very difficult, very difficult. We call it the medical model, the institutional model. The model of care based on large buildings that house many residents in settings that really are not anything at all reminiscent of a home. We like to call them homes, but if you walked into them, you would actually think you were in a hospital. To imagine that it's anything less to elders who are, are being cared for in those situations, it's, it's just not realistic. Institutional model of care is built for the um, efficient care of the masses. So sometimes that personhood is kind of downgraded a few notches and their medical condition or their surgical procedure seems to be the, the paramount thing. Sadly, their physical needs seem to take precedence over their emotional needs, their spiritual needs, their needs for, for things that are beyond uh, basic care. Sometimes when you get caught up in like, oh my God, I gotta get like 12 people up and, and so-and-so's got, you know, so-and-so's family's coming, so we gotta get them all done, you know, and it's just this constant juggling of time. We know we're on a bit of a schedule, but we're also relaxed. I'm aware that the girls always have six to 10 other issues on their mind. They don't talk to me about it, but I know. And they all want to do their best too, right? Because they, they're like, well, I would never treat my parents this way. So they all have their own kind of expectation. So when, when they can't meet those expectations, they're pretty hard on themselves. And now they're wearing those masks, it makes it harder. In, in healthcare, we run often at very fine margins. Our systems are dependent on there not being too many crises. But COVID has taught us that the crisis can be long. None of us at the time had any idea that there was a, anything to protect us and certainly nothing to protect our elders who really died at, at uh, very dramatic rates, which uh, was a very sad situation. It really put the spotlight on how these elders were living in their, in their facilities, sharing a room with anywhere from one other to three other residents, separated only by a, a curtain in the rapid spread of infection. It was borne out in those types of situations. So 
it really is not a way for, for elders to live. Uh, a pandemic takes away the living part of life. We're forced to isolate people in their rooms. We've been forced to isolate people from their families. That's the challenge for us going forward. Um, maintaining that safety, that level of rigor that keeps people safe from a thing like COVID. But we have to find ways to uh, maintain the, the, the living, the quality of living that is so important to human beings. We need to move away from uh, medicalizing the end of people's lives and the shift is towards the social needs. And the social care has to shift that to being less time efficient and more focused on that individual controlling their own day. We've got great research uh, from around the world. We know the kind of buildings that work. There are a few models that are in existence across the globe. One of them in the Netherlands, it's called De Hogewick. It is a typical village concept, a situation where elders live in small homes with small numbers of fellow residents and live a life that's much more natural. It's truly creating a small home for a small family of residents. All the homes have 12 beds, well, 12 rooms with private bathrooms. There'll be a common area and a kitchen that they have access to. We're going to be changing how many people walk through those areas to try to normalize your, their lives. Like you don't have housekeepers and you don't have laundry staff walking through your house at home, so they shouldn't be having that here. So making our, our facilities and our services appear less clinical, less medical, but still maintaining that medical clinical rigor that people with that level of complexity require. There'll be a coffee shop there where people from the external community can come into our internal community. And there'll be play structures to try to welcome families when they come in to bring their children. There's gonna be a daycare there incorporating youth with the residents. It's gonna create a, a natural um, hub of activity that will be in itself stimulating and interesting, not just for the elders themselves who will be exposed again to the world outside, but in fact it will also help to expose the children of tomorrow to the elder part of our population. We're talking about changing a culture of care that's focused on what the resident wants in the moment versus the list of tasks that the worker has to get through. The infrastructure that we have is not only old, it's wrong, it needs to be corrected. This is gonna require redevelopment of, of virtually every site in the province, if not the country, for the, the social needs of, of elders. It takes courage to get old. It definitely is not an easy process. I think the biggest thing that it will, will give for most people is that they won't have to fear um, living in a care facility the way some people currently do. I think they will see the care facility as an extension of their own, own home, hopefully. They'll see it as a place that honors their values, their traditions, the interests that they have. And I think they'll see that we can convert our compassion and our hard work into also a day well lived for, for the individuals. There's a divine hand that's leading you, whether you believe it or not, and you go with the flow and you learn what there is to learn. You can't physically touch the success that we're going to have. As supportive as the government is with all of the demands they have, they just can't give us all the funds that, that we need to do all that work. So I'm extremely grateful to the St. Paul's Foundation uh, for the funds that they, they already provide us um, and hopefully for the funds we'll get in the future. And I'd say to those donors that funding elder care may not be as sexy as a CAT scanner or some other large medical device, but what you will see over, over the years to come is the life experience of those elders we're looking after, which could very well be your, your, your loved ones or you yourself, be something you can be proud of and something that we can be proud of.
Um, so yeah, I, I hope that video in, in the words of residents and staff that are currently at The Views gives you a sense of where we're at. And I think we're quite evangelical about our, our attempt here. Um, and those of you who've worked in this area will know this is not an easy thing that we're trying to do. But with this new building and with the funding that we've been given, uh, not just through the government, but through the St. Paul's Foundation, we're very determined to really try and replicate some of those, um, those ways of doing things that, that have been pioneered in other, in other jurisdictions. So, um, you know, please keep us in your prayers for, uh, for success because um, it is not an easy thing that we're embarking on. It's a wholesale culture shift and change. So um, that I think is, uh, is, is what we're, we're endeavoring to do.